Hello everyone and welcome to the third and last session of our three-part Applied Remote Sensing Training SAR for Detecting and Monitoring Floods, Sea Ice and Subsidence from Groundwater Extraction. My name is Erica Podest and I'm a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory as well as an instructor with the RCEP program. I will be hosting today's training. Today, I will be joined by le guest lecturer, Dr. Franz Meyer, who is professor for radar remote sensing at University of Alaska Fairbanks, as well as chief scientist of NASA's Alaska Satellite Facility Distributed Active Archive Center. Today, he will be focusing on detecting and monitoring floods with SAR. To begin, I'll provide an overview of our training before we begin the session. I'll first be providing an overview of our training before we begin this session. The objective of this webinar series is for participants to learn how to use SAR to detect and address potential disasters related to sea ice, floods, and groundwater extraction. And these sorts of events can have a large impact on human lives, infrastructure, and the economy. So SAR can be critical in informing on the ground efforts, on disaster mitigation efforts, and resilience. By the end of this webinar series, participants will be able to detect and monitor sea ice to identify potential risks to shipping and coastal erosion. So that was the first session generate subsidence maps due to groundwater extraction to inform risk and resource management. That was the second session. And then detect and monitor floods in order to more closely monitor increase or decrease of floodwaters and better inform disaster response and management. And that is today's training. Here's an outline of the training. Today is the third and last session of this three-part webinar series. All presentation slides, recordings, and Q&A transcripts will be available on the training page. There will be one homework assignment, which will open today, Wednesday, November 1st, and it will remain open until November 17. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignments before the given due date. And finally, um, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that you have, if you have a question, to please type it in the questions box. And under this platform, it is uh, located in a different place. It's at the bottom right under the three points. There's a, there's a drop down menu. And uh, one of those three options in the drop down menu is questions. So please write your questions there and we will address all questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and feel free to uh, type in your questions as we go along. The, uh, all the questions will be assembled into a Google Doc and that Google Doc will then be posted onto the training page with all the answers. We're very pleased to have Dr. Franz Meyer as guest lecturer today. He is an expert in SAR and has been a major force in global SAR capacity building efforts and in making SAR more usable by the scientific and applications community. There's a reason he's known as the SAR evangelist. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, for joining us today and for so generously sharing your knowledge and wide experience in the use of SAR for detecting and monitoring floods. Welcome. Thank you, Erica, for a kind introduction. So my name is Franz Meyer. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, where I'm specializing on teaching uh, topics of microwave uh, remote sensing. I also am the uh, chief scientist of the Alaska Satellite Facility, uh, which is uh, probably one of the data sources that you will be using um, when you're working with synthetic aperture radar data sets. So I'm giving you today session three of this um, three session training on SAR for detecting and monitoring floods, 
CIs and subsidence. And uh, so my session today will focus on the monitoring of flooding events uh, with SAR. The, um, um, the content today uh, is intended to introduce you to the properties and the benefits of synthetic aperture radar data sets for flood monitoring, but specifically for benefits of some of the more commonly used uh, data sets these days, which is Sentinel-1, an ongoing mission launched by the European Space Agency uh, that's currently in orbit and provides regular observations uh, for flooding events. In an upcoming mission called NISAR uh, that I'll int introduce, uh, that's a collaboration between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization and will also provide fantastically useful data sets for flood mapping. Um, I hope that you walk away understanding um, how different land cover types look in SAR images and how specifically water surfaces look different from most of the other land surfaces and therefore, therefore can be distinguished from these other uh, land surface types. Um, and we, we will talk about um, how to identify open water areas using uh, thresholding approaches and I will show you a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, uh, that you can use to uh, exercise um, thresholds-based flood mapping for a sample data set um, over the Hindukush Himalaya. Um, and at the end, uh, we'll talk about the capabilities of these threshold-based algorithms, but we also talk about some of the limitations of these techniques um, that will help you uh, use the right data set for, for your particular flood application. So I believe that right now you are you are taking this course at the perfect time. It's a really good time to learn about SAR right now. And it's specifically because of two fantastically useful sensors, uh, synthetic aperture radar data sensors, Sentinel-1 and NISAR. Uh, so I want to talk to you about their sensor characteristics um, and how you can access data sets from these uh, two missions, which both are very useful for the um, application of flood monitoring. So SAR has gone undergone a great transformation over the last maybe five to seven years. And it is related uh, to the advent of new sensors that provide free and open regularly sampled data sets on a global scale. Uh, you see here an example in this animation that shows you repeated uh, images over Bangladesh. Um, in these images, you see a, a variety of different brightness uh, patches. And you see that at some point, uh, very dark patches show up. These are uh, surface water extent uh, features we'll talk about uh, in this class why these surface water extent features look very dark uh, in SAR images. But the key is that these modern data sets such as Sentinel-1, the upcoming NISAR mission, and other uh, many upcoming missions uh, in the space of SAR, they provide you regular observations every six to 12 days over these uh, features that are flooding in the landscape uh, and the regular observations in the free, free and open data set are really key to use SAR data sets uh, in operational response and operational flood monitoring. So I wanna bring uh, those sensors to you real quick. Um, the first of those sensors you probably already have heard of and maybe you have used that sensor already in your work. It is Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 uh, was launched in 2014. It's a constellation of two C-band radar satellites. We'll talk about the different wavelengths and bands of SAR here in a little bit. Um, Sentinel-1 um, was brought along a pivotal change um, in, in the use of SAR because it was the first SAR satellite system with an operational mission. Uh, this means that uh, Sentinel-1 is required to observe every point on Earth um, at a 12-day uh, cadence, some places in, in Europe uh, at an even higher cadence, um, usually six-day cadence. So we have regularly, reliably observed data sets because it's a synthetic aperture radar. One of the benefits of it, it is, it is cloud-free and weather independent, and it images all land masses, all coastal, coastal zones, and shipping routes every six to 12 days. Additionally, Sentinel-1 is also specifically designed for INSAR, while this particular lecture did, does not utilize the capability of interferometric SAR, you heard about INSAR uh, in previous lectures, especially the ones that focused on landslide um, displacement from landslides. And key to Sentinel-1 is that all data sets they observe 
uh, are freely and openly available. This free and open means that you can access the data sets for free, um, independent of your application. Uh, so you can apply these data sets to any kind of uh, application you want. So Sentinel One was launched by the European Space Agency, as mentioned earlier in, in uh, 2014. Um, starting in 2014, uh, free and open data sets globally acquired. It's a constellation of two C-band SAR sensors. You can remember, try to remember already, C-band is a microwave wavelength uh, that is used fairly heavily in Earth observation, and it has a wavelength of about 5.6 centimeters. Uh, Sentinel-1 is also providing multiple polarizations, typically dual pole data in VVVH polarization over land. Also, polarization is something we will uh, talk about more uh, later in this class. The data sets have a resolution of roughly about 10 meters, so 5 by 20 meters, roughly about 10 meter scale uh, pixel size. And uh, every image has a swath of 250 kilometers. Uh, so you get very large coverage um, with every uh, rotation of the satellite around Earth. The temporal samplings is six days over Europe and 12 days uh, for the rest of the globe. Uh, and it has both imaging and interferometry capability, as mentioned earlier. And one of the things you can do is the image that you see in the background here is actually a flood detection image. The different shades of blue here show a water extent at different time steps and how Sentinel-1 can be useful for flood mapping, we will discuss in this class. This animation shows you how the, the constellation of Sentinel-1 uh, sensors operates to ensure global coverage every 12 days. So we have two satellites that are offset by about half an orbit, uh, scanning the planet um, completely within 12 days. Um, unfortunately, one of these two satellites in this constellation specifically Sentinel-1B, so the two constellation satellites are called Sent Sentinel-1A, which was the one launched in 2014, and Sentinel-1B for the second satellite launched in 2015. Sentinel-1B had a uh, failure in December 2021 and is currently not providing any additional data sets. Um, so there's some limitation in coverage at the current point. However, a replacement satellite called Sentinel-1C is planned to be launched uh, sometime in 2024, likely late 2024 or early 2025. If in the full constellation of two satellites, um, Sentinel-1 provided uh, global observation with quite high density, this plot shows you how many acquisitions were made per month uh, in 2021 uh, when the full uh, two satellite constellation was still available. Uh, so you see that there's lots of coverage, especially in the higher latitudes, uh, in many of the tectonic sites, um, uh, and also uh, good coverage for the for the rest uh, of the land masses. Um, so all the blue areas shown here, these are the land masses covered by Sentinel-1. After the failure of Sentinel-1B, the coverage decreased uh, to some degree. So this is giving you a little bit of an idea, this animation, what the coverage looks like since then. Um, so there are some areas that have not been covered extensively, such as um, 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 Siberia uh, and some places in Africa. Um, over time, ESA started adjusting a little bit the acquisition scenario to have more global coverage available, even on, with only one satellite in, in place. Uh, but note that in 2024, late 2024, we expect that Sentinel-1C will be launched uh, to recover the full cap capability of the Sentinel-1 uh, constellation. So Sentinel-1 is one of those two data sets um, that you will work with extensively, I would expect, when using SAR for flood monitoring. Another data set along the similar, the similar um, properties is the, NISAR, the NASA ISRO SAR, or short NISAR mission. So this is a collaboration between the US space organization, NASA, and the Indian space research organization, ISRO. They uh, collaborated to build uh, this mission, which uh, an artist view you see on this slide. NISA is gonna be exciting. It's, it's launching in spring of 2024. We expect uh, the launch to happen probably around uh, April next year. It uh, uh, brings a, a few firsts. 
um, it's going to be the first space-borne L and S-band uh, dual-frequency uh, radar satellite. It will also, like Sentinel-1, provide full global coverage every 12 days. But in contrast to Sentinel-1, which operated at C-band, remember C-band was about 5.6 centimeters wavelength, um, NISA will operate at L-band, uh, which provides at roughly 25 centimeters wavelength. So it's about five times the wavelength. And the longer wavelength has some benefits um, for a number of applications, including flood monitoring. We'll discuss uh, these uh, benefits a little bit later uh, in this lecture. Um, NISA will provide an enormous amount of data set um, uh, or data volume per year. NISA is expected to provide 50 petabytes of data, which uh, roughly is about uh, maybe 10 times as much as Sentinel-1. Uh, over its planned mission lifetime, which is three years, um, we have 150 uh, petabytes of data that NISA will bring. All data from NISA are also free and open. Um, so again, you can access these data sets for free and you can apply these data sets to any application that you care about. Uh, specifically, NISA will provide data uh, that feeds into uh, a number of science applications disciplines. Um, the main science disciplines supported by NISA include solid earth science. This includes things like um, studying earthquake dynamics, uh, volcanic cycles, landslides, ground subsidence from groundwater extraction, and so on. It additionally supports cryospheric science. Uh, this includes uh, the movement of glaciers, the movement of, and extent of sea ice, and uh, the movement and extent of ice sheets. And then lastly, uh, the L-band um, data set is very useful for ecosystem science. So it's uh, going to provide data sets that can be used to understand forest biomass and biomass change, um, agriculture extent and agriculture dynamics, as well as wetland. It also will support wetland monitoring. In addition to these science disciplines, there are a number of application disciplines, such as, such as flood monitoring, that will be supported by NISA quite well. So both of these data sets, Sentinel-1 and NISA, will be available for you, for your research, through the services of the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility, or the NASA ASF DAC. DAC stands for Distributed Active Archive Center. So NASA operates many of these data centers um, uh, for different disciplines, and these data centers house all the NASA-owned and NASA-related um, Earth observation data sets for you. ASF is the Data Center for Synthetic Aperture Radar Data. It was established in 1991. We were established uh, back in the days uh, mostly to provide downlink uh, from uh, a downlink station from Earth observation satellites. But uh, this mission was expanded um, a few years later to also include the data archive. Today, ASF is providing access to about 20 petabytes of SAR data uh, through its archive. And ASF is unique uh, in the fact that all of our data are located in the Amazon Web Services cloud and all data are ready for you to use. So, so none of the data need to be ordered. They are all um, on live spinning disks, um, ready for your science uh, usage. Um, ASF provides access to 40, more than 45 years of data sets um, these days, uh, starting in 1978 uh, with the CSAT mission. Um, it is the current, um, one of the current archives, global archives for Sentinel-1, shown here on the left-hand side and will be the data center for NISAR. So all the level zero to level two data sets from NISAR will be available through ASF. As a side note, uh, some of you may be aware, aware of another NASA project that's called OPERA. OPERA provides um, large scale um, level three science products from Sentinel-1 at NISAR. Um, OPERA is producing things like surface water extent. So it's, they provide a product that we'll talk about today a lot. They also provide uh, global surface disturbance uh, information as well as North America-wide um, uh, ground displacement. Uh, these data sets from OPERA will also be available um, uh, through ASF, specifically the displacement data set will be available through ASF. I'm, I'm not gonna give you a grand tour of ASF in this particular lecture, but the slide decks contain some links um, on, on, on this slide here, you see a link to the ASF search interface. 
this is a one-stop shop for the discovery and the on-demand processing and downloading of SAR datasets from missions such as Sentinel-1 and NISAR. Uh, so all of your Sentinel-1 and NISAR datasets you'll be able to find through this convenient uh, search and discovery interface. I also provided a link to the ASF website. Uh, this gives you more information about the census we hold and all the other activities uh, that ASF is conducting uh, in the field of synthetic aperture radar. So please check out these links. Uh, and uh, there's also feedback buttons on this website, uh, which you can use uh, to ask ASF any questions you may have. Now, these both, both of these data sets um, um, are great for surface water mapping. And in this next section, I, I want to talk about why SAR is really good um, for um, detecting surface water uh, in a landscape. So firstly, uh, SAR is really useful for emergency response for some simple re reasons. Um, SAR datasets operate in the so-called microwave spectrum or the radar spectrum of the electromagnetic, um, um, uh, overall the electromagnetic spectrum. Let me turn on my laser pointer here. So we're operating in this uh, frequency range uh, between about one centimeter wavelength and roughly about a meter wavelength. This is where all the microwave data sets sit. This is distinctly different from the visual uh, range, which is, is in the order of a few, few microns or a few hundred nanometers. Um, one of the differences between those two spectra is um, that the atmosphere is very transparent uh, in the microwave window which allows weather independent observations of planet Earth. So for flooding, that's particularly important. Um, flooding often happens uh, during cloudy conditions when, when rainfall is happening and having a, a weather independent and cloud penetrating observation platform uh, for obs observing the impacts of severe weather is very useful and radar provides that capability. Um, other benefits uh, we'll, we'll talk about is that SAR is really good for change detection. Uh, this is related to the fact that SAR or radar is an active uh, observing instrument. So we are actively sending out microwave signals from a satellite. Um, those signals travel to the ground, uh, get reflected and come back um, to our sensor. This makes us independent of sunlight and it provides a very stable observation scenario. So if you take it, an acquisition today, and we take a repeated acquisition 12 days uh, later because we are sending the exact same amount of energy from the exact same location uh, down to Earth. Uh, we have a very repeatable observation condition, which lends itself really well for change detection. Another reason why SAR is really useful is because <clears throat> the observation wavelength is quite different from what you're used to from optical systems or uh, from what you're used to, what you're seeing with your eyes. This may make SAR data sets a little bit uh, difficult to interpret at first, but it means that you provide complementary data to optical sensors. Um, so we are providing independent information about the surface. We are seeing different things about the plants and the surface structures uh, on, on a landscape. And so that's really useful, combining optical data with SAR data sets together in classifications or interpretations can be quite useful. This animation here, uh, developed by the German Aerospace Center, gives you a little bit of an idea of the benefit of the weather independence uh, of these uh, SAR datasets and why it is particularly important for, the, um, for understanding hazards related to flooding events. So the idea, as mentioned earlier, is uh, during um, flooding events, usually we have um, poor weather conditions, we have cloud cover and rainfall, uh, and optical data sets won't be able to see the ground from space. Uh, ground will be obstructed by clouds. Uh, SAR satellites such as TerraSAR, Sentinel-1, NISAR, however, have the capability to penetrate through these clouds. You can see that here in a second in this animation. So we can see through this cloud cover, this is the first benefit for flood monitoring. But then when we hit water surfaces, we, we also see that these water surfaces look quite different than the landscape. You see water is very um, dark in these images, much darker than the rest of the landscape. 
And we will talk about how you then can use the unique characteristics of water to automatically extract water from those SAR images and then overlap these or overlay these water information with other information such as um, road information or where the buildings are located uh, to understand impacts of flooding events. So these modern SAR sensors today provide these data sets regularly. This is again a, an example from the Hinakushi Malaya. You see a time series of every 12 days observations uh, for this area of interest. And again, you see the development of surface water and you can um, even visually already see how surface water expanded and changed uh, throughout the flood season in this area. This is Bangladesh. And the impacts you're seeing here are related to the annual monsoon uh, flooding events that typically start in May to June of the year and end in September, October. Here, another example of the benefits of SAR for water surface mapping. This is a side-by-side um, -side comparison of an optical time series, in this case, over uh, the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, you see in the optical data set that heavy cloud cover on many days obstructs um, the uh, sort of the, the water surface from view while the um, SAR uh, time series on the left uh, gives you consistent access uh, to the surfaces um, underneath the clouds. And you can see here, hopefully, uh, in some areas how water surfaces are expanding. If you see my laser pointer here, you see expanding water surfaces that happen as rain falls uh, in this region. So um, this sort of shows you a little bit the benefit of SAR data sets uh, for, you know, uh, for monitoring hazards uh, related to rainfall and flooding. Uh, I want to briefly talk about the different flavors of radar uh, that are available for your use. Uh, so similarly to the visual range, in the microwave spectrum, we tend to split up the spectrum into different subbands. In the visual range, you would call these colors. Uh, you know, blue, um, red, green are all different parts of the visual uh, range uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. In the microwave, we use a somewhat a bit more complicated nomenclature for these uh, different subbands. Uh, we use letters such as X, C, S, L, and P to distinguish different subbands of the microwave uh, spectrum from each other. Um, so X-band is the shortest of these wavelengths uh, that are typically used for Earth observation. These X-band satellites have wavelengths of about 3.5 or so centimeters. They uh, provide very high resolution imaging and they are mostly used for understanding things like urban developments uh, and uh, are also useful for very small scale uh, features and changes on, lands, on the land surface. Um, or um, the purpose of flood monitoring and, uh, and sort of also analysis of ecosystems. Um, X-band um, sensors have very little penetration into vegetation. And so what this means for you, if you're interested in monitoring flooding, it means that these X-band data sets cannot see water under vegetation. So this is one limitation that's very similar to optical data. Um, if you have trees obstructing the surface, uh, you won't be able to map water under those trees using these X-band data sets. Going to uh, longer and longer wavelengths, the next uh, wavelength uh, subgroup is C-band radars. C-band radars operate in the order of about five and a half uh, centimeters wavelength. Um, they are sort of the workhorse of SAR. Many of the satellites that are in space right now operate at C-band. The reason why C-band was picked uh, initially is that it is um, able to provide information about a lot of different things. So it's sort of an, um, it's good at a lot of things, but not really perfect for any one of them. Uh, it still provides decently high resolution. It provides a little bit more penetration into vegetation, but it's not really good yet for extensive uh, vegetation characterization. And it doesn't really have quite enough penetration yet to reliably allow you to discover water under vegetations. 
So it's useful for a broad range of things, but it's not really optimal for any of them. So that's why it was picked sort of as a starting point um, to be able to support data for a really wide range of applications. Sentinel-1, one of the missions that you likely will be using, is operating at C-band. Um, to longer wavelengths, we have then S-band at about uh, 7.5 7 to 15 centimeter wavelength, L-band, which is focused roughly at about 25 centimeter wavelength, and then P-band in the order of about 60 centimeter wavelength on average. Uh, the ones that we'll talk about uh, today more is L-band. L-band is really good to provide global medium resolution SAR data. The NISAR mission, uh, which we discussed earlier, operates at L-band at 25 centimeters. It's really good for geoph geophysical monitoring. It provides substantial penetration into vegetation cover, which gives you good sensitivity to biomass. Um, so the penetration into the tree canopy allows you to characterize the tree canopy and estimate biomass and other vegetation parameters. And the penetration also means that now at L-band, we are much more capable of seeing water under vegetation, which is a topic that will come up a little bit later again in this presentation. So remember, well, today we'll talk mostly about C-band, about 5.5 centimeter wavelength, and L-band at about 25 centimeter wavelength. <clears throat> In addition to cloud penetration, um, radar also provides um, um, another capability that you don't get as easily from optical data. And uh, the capability is the exploitation of polarization. Now, what polarization is uh, the orientation of uh, the oscillation of an electromagnetic wave. So if you think of uh, electromagnetic signals, they are so-called transverse oscillating waves. Transverse uh, oscillating waves means that their direction of oscillation, here shown as this up and down sinusoid, is orthogonal to the direction of propagation. So the electromagnetic wave would travel from the hand, in this case, to this wall on the other side. So propagation is from left to right. But the oscillation is up and down, which is orthogonal to the direction of propagation. This transverse um, nature of electromagnetic waves gives us uh, the ability or allows us to, for these signals, it matters in which uh, plane the signal is oscillating. So the signal can oscillate up and down, like in this case, but it could also be oscillating left-right uh, in a horizontal plane. And it turns out that uh, signals with different oscillation planes they interact with the surface differently and give us independent information about the surface. The plane of oscillation we call then polarization. Uh, so a, a, um, a signal that travels in a plane that oscillates vertically, so up and down, we call vertical polarized. And signals that travel in a plane that oscillates uh, horizontally, we call horizontally polarized. And to show you an example that these different polarizations indeed lead to different um, imaging results, results, I'm showing you here some examples. What I'm showing you at the very left is a, um, in this case, a um, um, L-band uh, data set acquired by the ALOS Pulsar mission. So it's a 25 centimeter L-band uh, data set. The left shows you the, uh, the signal in, the, in an HH polarization. H, the two H's here mean that we are transmitting a signal that is horizontally polarized, so where the oscillation happens in this horizontal plane, and we are receiving uh, signals that were scattered back from the ground. We are receiving those signals also in that same polarization. So it's horizontal transmit and horizontal receive. These are those two H's. In the middle, you see um, a, a data set acquired over the same area, now in vertical polarization. So here we have uh, this transmitted a signal in, in, in sort of this up and down vertical oscillation and received signal in that same polarization. And if you compare those two data sets uh, to each other, you can see some uh, differences. 
you see that this um, area here, which ends up being a water surface, looks quite different in VV than it does in HH. So you see there is independent information provided here. Um, also on the sort of southern end of this data set, you see differences between the HH and the VV, with the HH having higher brightness in some parts uh, of this forest structure in this case, on the lower end um, of the data set. If you have polarization capability, you can do also funny things. You can do, uh, you can record uh, cross-polarized signals. Those are data sets where you transmit a signal in one polarization. For instance, you transmit, um, in this case, in horizontal polarization, but you're receiving energy uh, scattered back in the opposite polarization. So we transmit horizontal and we, we receive uh, vertically. This allows you to understand depolarization. Um, so in this case, you're, you're recording uh, signals that were changed uh, in their polarization. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later here on the slide uh, what causes depolarization and what this cross-polarized term tells you. Ah, and it comes actually here. Um, so these polarized data sets allow you to, to distinguish different types of scatterers on the surface. Um, and what we can distinguish are these three different scattering types from each other. We can, uh, for instance, uh, map out um, so-called rough surface scatterers. Um, these are these uh, signals uh, shown in blue. So if uh, the signal from the radar travels down to the ground and then scatters off of a rough surface in this single uh, scattering event um, mechanism, this is a rough surface scattering uh, event. And uh, we'll see that there's a apolarization that is particularly sensitive to rough surface scattering. A second um, uh, physical scattering process that SAR can distinguish is so-called double bounce uh, scattering. This is shown here in this uh, red color. Double bounce scattering happens, for instance, on tree stems. So if um, a signal travels down from the satellite, it may hit um, the ground, it may bounce forward from the ground, hit, hit a second uh, vertical structure, like in this case, uh, um, a tree trunk. And from, from there, it may reflect back to the satellite in this double, double bounce uh, situation. So vertical structures such as tree trunks, but also potentially light poles and other similar features, they provide very strong double bounce scattering. Other features that are heavy in double bounce are urban environments. Um, you can imagine a signal come down, um, to come down, hit the surface, bounce off the side of a, a building, and then come back um, uh, to the satellite. So it's the, the second kind of scattering process that SAR can identify and distinguish. Uh, and um, we'll talk on the next slide which polarization is strong at mapping out uh, double bounce uh, features. Um, the third scattering process is volume scattering. Um, what this means is we have, a, uh, again, a, a signal come in uh, from the satellite, and then it penetrates, this signal penetrates into a scattering volume, volume such as a tree canopy. In that volume, this, the signal may bounce many, many times from branch to leaf to branch to leaf and back. So there may be you know, hundreds of bounces within that volume before the signal bounces eventually back to the satellite. These many bounces in a random volume, those are um, the main process that can cause depolarization, that can cause an incoming signal of a certain polarization to lose its uh, polarization in integrity. So we depolarize the signal and uh, the return signal may have equal amounts of horizontal and vertical polarization. And so this, these cross-polarized signals that we looked at on, on the previous slide, they are really good at detecting uh, the degree of depolarization and really good at quantifying volume scattering. And volume scattering um, happens very heavily in tree crowns and vegetation covers. So data at multiple polarizations then allow you to discriminate uh, these different scattering types. And this is the case because rough surface scattering tends to be particularly strong in vertical polarization. Double bound scattering is particularly strong in horizontal polarization. 
and volume scattering is the main source for depolarization so shows up uh, very heavily in these cross-polarized terms. So these terms where we transmit one polarization, for instance, horizontal, and receive the other polarization, uh, such as vertical. So if you have all these polarizations available, you could look at ratios in power. If a pixel has higher power in VV than in HH, it is likely dominated uh, by rough surface scattering. Um, to show you what different surface types look like in SAR images, I want to show you this example. This is a, um, a very large uh, SAR mosaic actually acquired by a mission called SMAP. This is a, uh, an L-band uh, mission operating at about 25 centimeters. And this mosaic shows the Amazon rainforest basin. Uh, if you know the area, uh, this rainforest basin contains uh, lots of... Um, a tree uh, cover and, and vegetation cover. Those are shown in these um, sort of intermediary gray uh, landscapes. It contains some water surfaces uh, and also some inundated um, uh, vegetation. So these dark features shown here, these are uh, water surface features. Those, um, um, those areas look dark because of the following reason. SAR satellites turn out to be observing the planet always in a slightly side-looking manner. This has to do with the way SAR images form, are formed, um, the, the process of, of SAR image formation, which we won't discuss uh, in this lecture, um, uh, necessitates that the SAR satellites always look slightly to the side. So there's an angle here that's not zero um, that describes the degree of uh, side-looking of a satellite. So the satellite looks to the side, it transmits energy uh, to the ground. If this energy hits a very smooth uh, surface, then the uh, scattering happens in a forward, um, in a forward angle. Uh, so the scattering happens in, in an optical scattering process um, where the incoming uh, signal is scattered away from the sensor in this sort of um, um, opposite direction uh, from that smooth surface. So a very smooth surface, such as a water surface, will return very little signal back to the sensor and therefore will look uh, always quite dark um, in these SAR images. And this is an, a, um, a fact that we will exploit uh, when we try to detect water in SAR data. If you add roughness uh, to the surface, uh, such in this area that's circled in, in yellow here. This is an agriculture site. Um, so these are fields that are plowed and, and, and cultivated. Uh, the plowing adds um, surface structure to the surface and roughness to the surface. Um, this roughness means that um, the scattering happens in, into a variety of different uh, orientations and the sum of the signal now comes back to our sensor. It turns out the rougher the surface, uh, the more uh, signal is scattered back uh, to the satellite sensor. And SAR is really good at measuring surface roughness this way. Um, we see um, other intermediary gray uh, surfaces here. These are vegetation surfaces. Uh, so here signal comes down, it penetrates into the tree cover. There are many, many bounces that are happening here and then signal comes back to the radar. Um, how bright these uh, vegetation patterns look uh, depends on the amount of structure of the tree canopy. The more biomass, the more above ground structure the tree has, uh, the higher the rate of brightness becomes. This is really useful because we can look at uh, the amount of scattering in, in, in radar over tree covers and can use that to understand the amount of biomass. The more scattering, the more, the higher the biomass uh, of the forest. Lastly, in this area, you see these very, very bright patches. Um, those are really interesting uh, and we'll get back to a little bit later. What's happening here is we have inundated vegetation. At L-band, we have the, the ability for the radar to penetrate through the tree cover enough to incur scattering uh, on the surface. If that surface is a water surface, we have very strong forward scattering uh, on this water surface 
um, the forward scattered signal may, will then bounce off of uh, tree stems in neighboring trees, and from there will be sent back to the radar. So we get a very strong double bounce uh, effect that makes these inundated vegetation features very bright. And we'll see later that these very bright features in rainforests in other vegetation covers um, can be used uh, to understand um, the amount of inundated vegetation uh, in an area. So as mentioned, um, in order to be able to see the um, a water under vegetation, we need to be able to penetrate through the vegetation. It turns out the amount of pen uh, penetration is dependent on the radar wavelength. Um, so the shorter the wavelength, the less penetration um, is available uh, for the same type of target. So if we, take a, uh, if we take a tree stand and we observe this tree stand at say three different wavelengths, uh, such as X-band, uh, C-band and L-band, uh, you can see in the sketch here is that the longer the wavelength becomes, so we go from three centimeters at X band to five centimeters at C band, centimeters at L band, the higher the penetration into that vegetation cover uh, becomes. Uh, so that's really, this means that L-band is really useful for vegetation penetration and is much more useful for seeing uh, water under the tree covers. This penetration ability also uh, holds true for some uh, dry soil areas like dry alluvium, um, the long trade. The same is true for glacier ice and snow cover. Um, the longer the wavelength, the easier we can penetrate into ice and snow and to deep, the deeper we can penetrate into uh, these surfaces. This means a short wavelength, uh, such as X-band. Uh, these radars um, scatter mostly off of the tops of tree canopies. Um, C-band to L-band has then increasing pen penetration ability, and longer wavelengths such, such as L-band are useful uh, for mapping of inundation under forest canopies. So missions, upcoming missions such as L-band, will give you improved capability to map water not only in open terrain, but also find water uh, under forest canopies. And an example of this you can see again on this slide, this is L-band data uh, coming from uh, a Japanese mission called ALOS-1. Uh, these data were acquired in uh, around, um, in the early 2000s. This is an area in Peru. And what you see here, you see the same area covered in two different times of the year. Uh, the left data set uh, is acquired during the dry season, where the, uh, where the, the water under the, under the vegetation is fairly uh, limited. And on the right-hand side is uh, a data set acquired uh, during the wet season, where we have more water under vegetation. Uh, in both cases, you can see that there's some water uh, present in both dates. Uh, this feature, for instance, is a water under vegetation feature that also survives uh, during the, right, uh, the dry season. But during the wet season, you can see that there's substantially more uh, open water um, under the vegetation cover. You have water over here in these bright patches. You see a lot of water also in these brighter patches up here. So you could use this to map out um, inundated vegetation uh, using these L-band data sets. So now we have an understanding roughly what drives uh, radar scattering, and we already understand a little bit about how surface water looks in SAR images. I want to dig into these surface water signatures a little bit more so that you understand what to expect um, when uh, flooding develops uh, in your area of interest. So the way we can detect surface water signatures in SAR data has to do with the different kinds of scattering uh, we observe uh, on these very smooth uh, water surfaces. So if you have a side-looking radar um, instrument uh, and the signals travel down to the ground, if the signal um, hits a smooth water surface, um, it will incur so-called specular reflection. So the incoming energy will be scattered forward in the opposite direction. This means over water, 
we have very little scattering that comes back to the radar in water typically looks quite dark uh, in SAR images. You can see that here in the on the right hand side. This is a data set in Norway where you can see these very dark uh, patches. Uh, those are lakes uh, in this landscape. In contrast, if the if the incoming um, signal hits uh, regular land surfaces uh, such as bare soils um, or veg vegetated terrain, we incur diffuse scattering. This is because of the roughness of the surface and the structure that grows or is on top of the surface. Diffuse scattering means that um, the incoming energy is scattered into a variety of different directions, including the direction back to the radar. So regular land surfaces look significantly brighter uh, than open water. And again, you can see that quite nicely here in this image on the right, where the um, water surfaces look distinctly darker than the regular land surface. Um, and so we can then think about um, what uh, the radar cross-section um, observed by a radar looks like as rain sets in and flooding occurs in a landscape. So I want to show you brief, briefly three um, SAR signatures for three different types of landscapes. Uh, and so what you see in both cases, we have a situation where at the beginning of the time series, so time is shown here on the on the x-axis, we have a reasonably dry surface. So in this first uh, observation spot, um, let's assume that rain is starting to fall. Early on in this time series, we have a relatively low soil moisture. Uh, and then as rain sets in, you see that progressively uh, soil moisture is increasing. So this left panel here shows you the change of soil moisture over time as precipita precipitation is falling. At some point in this time series, the, um, the surface may be completely fully saturated. Uh, and at this point, this is the point when surface water will form. So the soil is now not anymore able to absorb uh, additional precipitation and you know surface water and puddles on the surface are forming and expanding. So this is where flooding, where you have flooding in the landscape. Now, what does this look uh, conceptually in the SAR data set? Um, as um, the soil moisture, the moisture of the, the, the ground increases, this leads actually to a, to a continuous increase in the radar scattering uh, of the surface. Soil moisture turns out to be a very strong driver of how strongly microwave signals interact with soils. Uh, the, the wetter the soil becomes, the, the more effective it scatters uh, radar signals, and, and therefore the more the brighter the radar signal becomes. So initially, as the moisture content increases, we have a continuous increase in the radar cross-section of that soil in a time series. But then when surface water uh, develops, we now have standing water. This standing smooth water surface uh, causes the radar cross-section to drop. Uh, into uh, the basement here because now we have specular reflection. All the incoming signal is scattered away from the radar and we get very dark signals from this open land surface. So if water appears in, in open land areas, this is the radar cross-section time series you would expect. First brightening and once um, floodwaters appear, you get very dark responses. This is in contrast to water form forming under vegetation canopies. If, uh, so in this case, we have um, trees on the landscape and depending on your radar wavelength, you may be able to penetrate through, through these trees during both dry, dry and flooded conditions. If there are dry conditions um, and the signal penetrates to the ground, you incur sort of diffuse scattering on the ground um, so uh, some of the scattering comes back to the radar, a little bit um, bounces forward against the trees and then comes back to the radar. So we have moderate direct scattering and moderate uh, double bound scattering from these three canopies. If we, however, add water to the surface, so we have now rainfall and surface water is forming, <clears throat> we get, first of all, much more, much stronger scattering on the surface. If water scattering is forming, the scattering 
is a forward scattering case. So we have um, specular reflection with forward scattering. Um, the forward scattered signal now hits the tree stem very effectively and comes back to the radar. So the scattering becomes much brighter um, uh, in, in this area. So looking again at that same time series, <clears throat> so again, as, as rainfall uh, develops, we have first a gradual increase of radar backscatter related to an increase of soil moisture. But now at the point when surface water is forming, the brightness actually becomes very bright. So you jump up instead of down uh, because we get very strong double bounce uh, signatures in these, under these uh, vegetation can canopies. So there's a difference between open land. In open land, uh, the scattering went down to zero. In, uh, in flooding under vegetation, the scattering jumps up to very bright uh, double bound scattering in inundated vegetation. So this inundated vegetation, again, as a reminder, is mostly observable at L-band, such missions uh, such as NISAR, uh, much more so than in currently available C-band data sets uh, from Sentinel-1. Um, to show you an example of flooded vegetation, um, um, you see here two cases of the Amazon rainforest, actually, in, in Brazil. On the left-hand side, you see uh, a situation where there is no flooding under the trees. This is during the dry season. You see the, uh, the field observation here on top. And on, on the bottom, you see the related uh, SAR observation. What you see here is in black. This is the, a river going through the Amazon rainforest in this case. And around it, you see moderately gray value bright uh, vegetation scattering uh, in, the, in the area, scattering from the trees. At this L-band data set now, if we get into a flood season, now we have standing water under these uh, trees. This leads to strongly enhanced uh, double bound scattering. And you can see that double bound scattering very nicely in this data set. So all of these bright areas in this data set is inundated vegetation that you can easily map out um, either in a GIS system or using some sort of an automatic technique. I'm going to skip forward real quick and show you a, a couple of examples of these scattering phenomena. So this, uh, to show you what this looks like in reality, um, I'm showing you a time series of data sets over India. So this is the north um, eastern part of India. Um, also here during the monsoon season, uh, there are flood, uh, floodwaters that are forming. The river that you see uh, go through these data sets is the Ganges River. And you see that um, during some time steps uh, early in the season, the, the background looks uh, more or less evenly bright. Uh, this is at the end of the dry season. And then as rainfall sets in during the monsoon, you see more and more dark patches show up that indicate uh, surface water. Now we can pick a pixel in this in this data set. We're picking this pixel over here, indicated by this uh, symbol in the map. And if we look at the time series for this pixel, you see a graph uh, here shown on the left. You see we have an early phase where scattering is fairly stable at about a brightness of minus five uh, decibels. And then uh, the radar brightness gradually decreases and settles into a much lower rate of brightness at about minus 20 dBs. And so if you want to interpret this, you can interpret this in, in the following way. This is the before uh, flooding uh, rate of brightness here on the very left. And as uh, rainfall sets in, more and more of this pixel becomes um, flooded and inundated with water. And um, at a certain point, this entire pixel is inundated and you get much darker scattering uh, from the from the specular reflection you get um, uh, from the inundation. So you could not only map, uh, identify this pixel as being flooded, but you could also roughly draw a line at which uh, time step uh, this pixel was completely inundated. To show you another example uh, of this uh, uh, data point number two here, uh, right next to the river, you see a little bit of a different behavior. You have uh, first again around roughly about minus five dB uh, stable scattering. 
um, as rain sets in, we, we then get actually an increase in brightness at first and then a decrease in brightness later. And the phases that you see here is that um, as water next to this river is rising, we have vegetated terrain around, uh, around that river. Initially, there's water happening under the vegetation in this area, which leads to a brightening of the radar cross section that you see here. But at some point, as the water con continues to rise, um, this vegetation in this area, which is not very tall, is actually completely inundated. And when it's completely inundated, you see how the radar cross section then uh, falls to the minus 20 dB uh, indicative of, of surface water. So we have initial inundated vegetation, and then at some point completely submerged vegetation uh, in, this, in these pixels. Um, a third data set I show you over here. Um, so these are uh, wetlands that are slowly uh, inundating in the time series um, at this point number three. And here you see that we have again minus five to be uh, background scattering early in the, in the time series. Then about in June uh, of that particular year, rain sets in and the radar cross section drops uh, to a certain level of about uh, roughly minus 10 dB. And then at a later stage, um, in August of that same year, it drops even further to minus 20 dB. We already know that the minus 20 dB is, is the fully inundated, um, uh, is indicative of full inundation of a particular pixel. But what happens in between is that this pixel, which has a, a 30 by 30 meter uh, footprint, uh, for a while was uh, partially inundated. This can happen if um, there's topography in the landscape and you have mounds and valleys, the valleys will fill up with water first. So part of that 30 by 30 meter pixel uh, has standing water and, and other parts of that pixel is are still um, elevated terrain. And only when also the rest of the pixel gets inundated, the rate of brightness will fall uh, to that minus 20 dB level. So these time series are really useful to understand how flood uh, progresses and to pick uh, time steps at which um, a certain pixel became fully inundated. Now at the very end, I wanna show you um, uh, how we can actually map these water, water surfaces uh, using SAR. And it's all based on this idea that um, water surfaces look much darker because of that specular reflection that we've already discussed. So we're trying to exploit uh, this darkness of surface water features to automatically identify them in images. And the way we do this is, or a very simple way of doing this, is using a thresholding technique. And so what we are counting on is that if we form, create histograms uh, from SAR images, a histogram is basically a bar chart where for every uh, brightness value, radar brightness value, we count the number of pixels that um, um, are characterized by this, by this particular brightness value. So this black line here in the background is a histogram of one star image. What it shows you is that you have most pixels have a radar brightness roughly of about minus five dBs somewhere between maybe minus eight uh, and maybe minus two dBs. Um, most pixels have rate of brightnesses like that. These are pixels that predominantly belong to the class land. So these are rough surfaces that and vegetation types uh, that form regular land surfaces. You see there's a, a second order um, appearance of pixels a lot of additional pixels have a rate of brightness here in this case of about maybe minus 17 dBs. These pixels are, pixels are significantly darker than the average land pixels, and those darker pixels belong all to the class water. So if you look at this histogram, you see uh, this histogram has two distinct, uh, if you want, humps. We call them usually two different modes. Um, and the darker mode usually um, relates to water and the brighter mode uh, relates to land surfaces. And we can draw visually a line that separates pretty well the water pixels from the land pixels. 
So this is what a thresholding approach is doing. It tries to find a separating line, uh, pixels that have uh, brightnesses below uh, that threshold value, uh, we would classify as water pixels, and pixels that have a brighter, brighter values than that threshold, we would classify as land. And you can see visually that this threshold is pretty good at dis discriminating those two classes from each other. On the left-hand side, you see a second case. Again, you see a very distinct separation of water and land. Again, here we can draw a threshold line that separates water and land pretty well from each other. So what this slide shows you is, first of all, that thresholding is a really convenient and easy way to do water mapping in SAR images because it exploits this dark signature of water. But it also shows you a little bit of the complications of this technique. Um, you see, first of all, that the water and land class are not equally separated in those two cases. Uh, these two cases are distinguished uh, by some uh, geometry characteristics. So one of them is acquired with a look angle of 23 degrees. So this is a radar that looks very steeply to the ground. The other one, uh, the other radar looks a little bit more shallow. Uh, this observation has 45 degrees. The point here is that different observations may not provide you equal separation between water and land. And the optimal threshold uh, that distinguishes water from land may also not be in the same case. So in the, in the right-hand side case, you would draw a separation line roughly about minus 17 dB, while on the left-hand case, you would draw it at about minus 10 dB at a quite different brightness value. So a key to a successful approach is to automatically determine what is the best separation line between water and land. And we may have to pick that optimal threshold for every single scene, because for every single scene, um, the separation between water and land uh, may be different. So we are looking for a, an adaptive approach that automatically finds the best separation threshold for every single data set. And so the approach that you will exercise in, in a lab um, is doing exactly that. It is uh, performing an adaptive uh, threshold-based uh, surface water mapping. It is an approach that uh, we developed in an uh, applied science uh, uh, project, a very simple but quite robust uh, threshold-based approach. This approach was actually used by a number of people or similar types of thresholding approaches were used by a number of people. Um, for instance, uh, there's a paper that's listed here on this slide uh, by Sandro Martinez et al. from the German Aerospace Center that uh, published a very similar approach uh, in their paper uh, from uh, 2015. Essentially, what we are doing is we take uh, original SAR datasets, we do some pre-processing uh, to these datasets, essentially to geocode um, the datasets and, and remove some image distortions that you get in SAR images. Uh, so, so this step number one prepares datasets, geocodes the datasets, so that we can do um, flood mapping on these images. Uh, once we have prepared the data sets, we can uh, do the automatic thresholding. So most of the secret sauce of the approach is hidden in this step two, where we're trying to automatically find the best separating threshold between a class land, which is the brighter class in a SAR image, and the class water, which is the darker class uh, in, the, in this particular SAR image. So step two provides um, the uh, threshold determination. Based on this threshold, we can separate uh, land from water classes, and we get what we often call an initial flood map or flood candidate map. We usually do a little bit of post-processing on, on that map, uh, which is uh, shown in, in steps four and five. Uh, this post-processing is mostly to remove some false detections. Sometimes uh, we may detect uh, land pixels as water pixels. Um, there may be reasons why sometimes uh, certain land pixels are dark, even though they don't contain water. So in this step four, we try to identify those pixels and remove them uh, from the initial detection. And in step five, in this approach, uh, we also perform an additional step um, where we try to separate uh, permanent water 
from actual floodwater extent. So permanent water would be the, the permanent extent of rivers, permanent extent of lakes, um, in contrast to uh, additional water you, you get during a flood situation. In the lab exercise we'll do here in a sec, uh, we will exercise steps two and four um, to get to uh, an initial flood map and then a post-processed um, false alarm reduced uh, flood map. Um, just briefly how the original flood uh, threshold detection works is so we need to find a way of automatically uh, finding the best uh, classification threshold for a scene. And the way we do this is we take a SAR scene um, like this. This is um, a scene that has about a 250 by 250 kilometer footprint. And let's assume that our scene contains uh, some water. So we have a lake, uh, we have a lake and a river uh, in that scene. What we do in, first, we we uh, we split up the scene into uh, smaller scenes. We call those tiles. These tiles are typically about five, uh, 200 by 200 pixels in size. And of all of these tiles, we try to initially identify tiles that contain roughly about equal amounts of water and land in them. And the way we identify those tiles is we look for tiles that are darker than the average uh, uh, tile brightness and uh, where the distribution of brightnesses in a tile has um, a larger standard deviation than the average. So why does, what, what does this mean? Tiles that have both water and land in it, they are darker than the average tile brightness because the water surfaces are much darker than the land surfaces. Um, so, so those tiles are biased low in average brightness compared to a tile over here, which only contains uh, land surfaces. So that's the first indicator. Um, um, to, um, so this first step by looking at average brightness will detect all tiles that contain water. Uh, so for instance, this tile here marked in red, but also potentially this tile down here, which basically contains only water. Um, to then focus on tiles that contain both water and land, we also look at the standard deviation. So we, we basically take all the pixels within the tile and calculate the brightness standard deviation. If we have both land and water classes in here, the standard deviation will be very large because we will have very dark and very bright pixels. Uh, and so the combination of average brightness and standard deviation um, lets us select these few tiles marked in red which contain both water and land. And these are very ideal tiles to do threshold calculation. We can then, for each of these tiles, find a best separating threshold between the water mode and the land mode. Uh, we get, for instance, five such thresholds from this technique, and we then end up averaging those five thresholds to get a final threshold for a scene. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail into the post-processing, but once we have a first detection using this automatic thresholding approach, we can get some false detections. Those happen often in, in, in topographically inclined terrain, where you may have radar shadow. Uh, it also happens sometimes in terrain that, say, may be covered in snow, such as, as high elevation, you may have sometimes snow cover. Uh, during warmer days, the snow cover may uh, melt on the surface. It may also look very dark, similar to a floodplain. And so those we may want to remove from our original detection. And we, our approach uses a set of criteria to identify pixels that are potentially uh, false detections. Um, we look at the radar brightness of those pixels. If the radar brightness is very close to our threshold, then we basically are saying we are not so sure about about this particular detection. Uh, we also assume that um, uh, flooding happens mostly in flat terrain. So if we have flood detections in uh, in areas where the surface slope is very steep, we also uh, are doubt a little bit that this is a correctly uh, classified pixel. So we have a few of those rules that we put in place uh, to clean up our original detections. Uh, and these rules work pretty well. Uh, to show you an example, these are 
uh, flood detections in a very topographically inclined region in the Hinakuchi Malaya. This is in the Himalaya mountains. Uh, and uh, on the uh, right hand side, you see the SAR scene in this particular case. On the left hand side, you see the original um, initial flood, flood candidate pixels. Um, many of these flood candidates detected here are actually false alarms. These are pixels that happen to look dark but are not water covered. Um, once we apply the post processing step, many of these pixels are removed. So you see here in the comparison, so this here is before post-processing. We see lots of false alarms. After process post-processing, uh, many of these false alarms are gone. And these features that are left here, actually, those are true water bodies. Uh, this, for instance, is a high-altitude lake uh, in the Himalaya Mountains. So it's quite effective uh, post-processing step. Uh, also, this step is included in your little lab exercise. So this is a very simple but yet quite powerful approach to water mapping. Um, on this slide, I show you that we actually built a service um, uh, based on this technique to do continuous uh, water mapping uh, in the Hinakushi Malaya region. So we do water mapping for Bangladesh, Northern India, uh, Southern Nepal, and Southern Bhutan. This slide includes a link. Uh, so once you have these slides, I encourage you to look at this link and, and explore that. Um, a platform that we've built that automatically does water mapping uh, in this region. In this platform, we provide uh, two layers. One of them is the uh, inundation uh, information in light, in sort of a lighter blue color, and in a darker blue color, we also provide a permanent water extent um, uh, to allow people to distinguish between the floodplain uh, and the, the perennial water surfaces in the in the landscape. And because we have data sets every 12 days. You can uh, animate uh, this information on in this web service uh, to sort of monitor how uh, the flood situation is developing in that particular region. Uh, this shows you a time series um, um, animation of uh, flooding in Bangladesh uh, from 2021, uh, where you can see how the floodplain is continuous, continuously uh, expanding uh, during the early phases of the monsoon uh, uh, in that particular year. Uh, here an example how this information can be used. This is uh, an example where you see on the left hand side uh, the surface water ex the, on the right hand side the surface water extent extracted from our service. This is for the uh, for the northeastern part of Bangladesh, and on the right hand side you uh, on the left hand side you see a, an area of photo to, to give you an impression of what that water extent looks like uh, on the ground. <clears throat> Um, again, because you have data sets every 12 days, you can not only um, you know, map water extent once, you can map water extent regularly. And this uh, data set shows you, or this slide shows you how you can use multiple uh, data sets to uh, do ad additional analysis. On the um, left-hand side, you see a surface water extent that it's analyzed as a function of time. Uh, so for every time step here, you see the amount of surface water that's present in, in the scene. This is for uh, 2020 in three provinces of Bangladesh. And you can see that in this particular year and in this particular area, uh, floodings uh, commenced in, in about early May of 2020, uh, initially encouraged by uh, Cyclone Amphan, which was a strong cyclone that hit uh, Bangladesh a bit before the regular monsoon start. So there was early uh, surface water extent. And then in June, the regular monsoon kicked in and added additional water uh, surface to this area. Uh, water extent peaked um, in, in early August and then slowly uh, receded until the end of the year. Uh, so that's one way of how you can analyze these data sets. You can also, if you have multiple observations, you can calculate how many days uh, particular areas are inundated. So this is a heat map here that shows you uh, sort of reddish regions are inundated for many, many days, uh, and blue regions are inundated only for short periods of time. This information can be useful if you have agriculture areas and you want to understand whether the crops uh, in the area uh, may have survived or may have um, um, drowned uh, during an inundation event. 
Uh, we've done um, a great deal of uh, evaluation of this uh, workflow too to understand the performance of this. I want to just show you a brief flavor of, of, of this analysis. Uh, we have uh, here a comparison between our water detections coming from SAR, in this case from Sentinel-1 SAR, uh, to water de detections from optical satellites. There are established methods how you can detect water from optical data as well. And if you happen to have cloud-free optical data, we can try to find pairs of cloud-free optical and um, um, SAR data sets that are within you know, one or two days uh, time difference to each other and then compare these water maps uh, to each other. And this slide shows you some examples. So on the on the very left, you see um, SAR data sets, um, what extent derived from SAR. Um, in the middle pane, you see what extent derived from optical data at um, time steps reasonably close to the SAR acquisitions. And on the right-hand side, you see the difference. So everything's in blue on the right-hand side, um, shows equal water extent and little patches that show red and light blue. Uh, those are differences between the optical and the uh, SAR um, detections. But you should see in this animation that SAR is quite good at uh, monitoring an event and seeing the changes of water extent uh, equal to what you would get from optical data if you were lucky and optical data were, and you get enough uh, cloud-free optical data sets. So before I go into the lab, I want to briefly uh, talk about limitations. Um, the limitations uh, for these threshold-based uh, mapping approaches, uh, one of the main ones uh, has to do with uh, wind roughening on water. So the premise of the approach was that water surfaces look very dark. And if you remember, the reason why they look dark is because water surfaces tend to be very smooth. Um, this premise is violated if we have strong winds during a SAR acquisition. Uh, so if you blow water over, uh, wind over water surface, you, uh, you create small ripples on the water surface. Those are called capillary waves. You can see that in that little image on the left-hand side. And this causes some roughening of the surface and an increase in brightness. So during days of very strong winds, this threshold-based approach may run into some limitations. You can try to mitigate this problem by doing um, um, thresholding not only on the VV uh, polarization, on the co-polarization, but also on the cross-polarization. It turns out these cross-polarizations are more resilient uh, to water roughening. So there's some workarounds uh, to mitigate the wind impact. In the notebook, the exercise that you'll be running will actually use both polarizations of Sentinel-1 uh, to be more robust uh, to wind impacts. Another main limitation is water under vegetation. Only certain radars will allow you to see water under vegetation. Um, this is particularly true for the longer wavelengths uh, such as NISAR, and much less true for the shorter wavelengths such as those provided by Sentinel-1. So the data that you'll be using in your exercise, those are Sentinel-1 data sets. Sentinel-1 is great at detecting open water surfaces, but not as good at detecting water under vegetation. A third one that I make, want to make you aware of is um, SAR, because of its side-looking nature, has some limitations of seeing water in dense urban environments. The reason is, if you look sideways to the ground, you um, may get large shadow effects where you there's an area behind tall buildings uh, that you cannot see with these side-looking radars. So everything that you see here, where I'm marking my, uh, my, mo my mouse, uh, this area where my mouse is at, this area is not cannot be seen by the radar because it gets shadowed off by this tall building here in the front. So shadow effects provide some limitations of seeing surface water uh, in urban settings. Uh, that's also something uh, to be aware of. And so here is an example of this impact of vegetation on water detections. This is, in this case, data sets from Sentinel-1. So these are C-band data sets 
the, the two shades of blue here, here are water detections, surface water that was found in those Sentinel-1 data sets. Uh, and what you may see is that the water detections end um, at the edge to this sort of light green region. This light green region is um, our mangrove forests. And it turns out that the radar signal cannot penetrate through those mangrove forests. So even though there is likely water under those mangrove trees, we cannot detect this water using Sentinel-1, using the C-band Sentinel-1 data set. Um, L-band data sets from NISAR will have much better capability to also detect water under these trees. Again, L-band is the way to go if you're interested in detecting water under vegetation, vegetation covers. So with this, uh, I want to end. Uh, I want to um, uh, give you at the very end a homework assignment. Um, we have a, a little exercise uh, that is created in a so-called Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to spend uh, five uh, to ten minutes real quick to explain to you how to run uh, this Jupyter Notebook and what kind of data sets uh, you will see uh, in this particular Jupyter Notebook, and then we'll send you off uh, to perform this exercise uh, on your own time. So the link to the uh, notebook that we'll be using is in the slide deck. Um, and so on this uh, slide here with the lab exercise, you can uh, click that link. Um, and uh, what this link is doing, it is opening a Jupyter Notebook for you. Uh, and I will explain to you how to run through this exercise real quick and how to use these Jupyter Notebooks. So now you see that the uh, Jupyter Hub is spinning up. Um, the environment was built and your environment is now spinning up. And uh, so the exercise that you'll be walk walking through is uh, conceived as a Jupyter Notebook. So what I'm explaining to you real quick is what this exercise is doing, what you will be working on, and how to use Jupyter Notebooks uh, to exercise this particular um, homework assignment. So um, Jupyter Notebooks are ways of sharing executable workflows with users. Um, and so in this particular workflow is doing flood mapping using the threshold holding algorithm we just talked about um, on a stack of Sentinel-1 SAR images. These notebooks are composed of sets of individual cells that have to be run in order. Um, you can see here the outline of one of these cells. So the uh, this, this blue line uh, indicates the uh, outline of that first cell that we have to run through. Um, this first one is a so-called markdown cell. You can see um, what cell this is um, also on the top uh, row of this interface where you can see here that this is labeled as a markdown cell. Markdown cells contain text and instructions that explain a, a, to a user what the notebook is doing. This next cell is also a markdown cell. It, it tells you a little bit about uh, how to run this particular bind, binder environment. A second uh, type of cell to be using uh, in these notebooks are so-called code cells. Uh, these can be identified with the gray background. Uh, code cells then um, include executable code. They have, been, have to be run in the order um, as they are given in order to uh, exercise this notebook start to finish. Um, so this notebook is walking you through that uh, flood mapping uh, workflow as shown in the slides earlier. So this graphic you, see, er, you saw earlier and the notebook includes the preparation of the data, the initial um, adaptive um, threshold calculation, the creation of an initial flood candidate map, and then some post-processing procedures to clean up those masks. So in order to execute those uh, code cells, uh, you have to uh, click into one of these code cells and then run the code cell. You can do that by clicking that run button, which is sort of this sideways triangle here. So you can click on that and it runs the notebook. You see that the notebook is running um, because there is a little star uh, in between these uh, square brackets. Once the code in that cell was completed, that star is being replaced by a number. This is a sequential number um, that sort of reminds you which code cell you have already run and which one was the last one you've run. 
So you can run through these code cells now one by one um, to execute these functions. Um, it is explained in a notebook when you walk through it what these functions do. Um, so we initially run through a set of predefined functions that we will use later in the flood mapping procedure before we then end up grabbing the data set. Uh, so I'm just going to run through these, these code cells one by one to show you what kind of end result you would expect once you ran through the notebook all the way. So let me run those, and then I go back and explain real quick. So these early code cells here load the data set. We are using a stack of Sentinel-1 images near the city of Malda. Uh, this is in near the Indian-Bangladesh border. Um, we have data sets that span the early part of the 2020 monsoon season. Uh, we have a, a total set, I think, of 15 or 16 data sets that we're analyzing here. These early code cells are downloading those data sets. This is a pre prepared data stack. You see here all the, the different images that we are analyzing. Uh, these are GeoTIFF images. The fine names here show you the dates of that image. So this is from the 2020, uh, from June 24th of 2020. And for each date, we have two uh, data sets. We have the VV, the vertical transmit, vertical receive data set, and the VH, the vertical transmit and horizontal receive data set. So we use both polarizations uh, for robust flood mapping, especially to be robust against wind impacts, uh, as we had discussed earlier. So we load these data sets in. Uh, we are also using some ancillary information in the form of a height above a nearest drainage layer. Uh, this is used to improve uh, thresholding and post-processing. I didn't talk about that uh, to a great deal uh, in the lecture, but it's uh, you can find some information in this notebook to explain how this hand layer is used. Um, and then there's a longer code cell that does the initial flood mapping. So this calculates the adaptive uh, dynamic thresholds for every uh, scene to create initial uh, flood extent maps. So this is a lengthy code cell that encodes all of the processing. And if you run that code cell, it's going to go through all of the images. So we have uh, 16 data sets. Um, for each of the 16 timestamps, we have two images, the VV and the VH image, that are both being thresholded uh, to calculate flood extent. So it goes through all of these images, calculates adaptive thresholds, these thresholds are shown here, what the numbers of these are. You can see that every image gets um, a different, automatically determined optimal threshold uh, to separate the water and land features from each other. Once done, there is a code cell that lets you evaluate the flood mapping results. So here we've analyzed the 16 time step time series, where you see that early in the, in the season, the surface water extent was fairly small. Um, it mostly was composed of the permanent uh, water bodies uh, in, in the landscape. And then as rain set in here, in this case, in June of 2020, you see a continuous increase of surface water extent until early August uh, before a water extent then slowly recedes. Also shown in this plot is a sort of red dashed line is the average flood area extent throughout this time series. Uh, later on in the in the time steps, there is a way for you to visualize the, the water detections on top of the SAR image. Um, so this shows you an example of these water detections, and uh, you can visually understand the fidelity of the detections. This is an interactive plot, so you can actually go in, um, and with that little button here, you can draw up a zoom window, window to sort of zoom into an area of interest uh, and analyze the flood detections with a little more detail. So once this zooms in, here you can see uh, in more detail the pixels that were labeled as surface water in the landscape, which in this case are all the dark pixels, and the land pixels are still uh, marked as, as land or not water pixels in this case. And at the very end, it also creates a summary statistic. We talked about this uh, in the slide deck. One way of utilizing um, time series of water detections is you can analyze for how many days a specific areas were inundated. Um, um, so in this time series, you can see the dark red pixels were inundated throughout the time series. We are covering here 45 days. Um, and uh, you see that's, of course, the river, uh, which is permanent water. 
uh, and then we have uh, some features also in the floodplain that were inundated for more than 30 days uh, during this flooding event. So please have fun with this notebook. Again, ensure that um, you exercise all of these code cells uh, one by one in sequence, and you do that by clicking into the code cell and then clicking that little sideways run button uh, to run one note uh, notebook cell. Once this one's run, please go to the next uh, code cell and execute the, the following one uh, to successfully run this notebook start to finish. Uh, in this notebook, there are a few stopping points in these green boxes where you can contemplate the questions that are posed to you in these in these little green boxes. And please follow these instructions to get a bit better feeling for the quality of the water mapping that is provided um, using this particular approach. I hope you have fun with the notebook um, and will be able to exercise this completely uh, on your own time. Thank you very much for that amazing presentation and demonstration. So to summarize uh, the key points from the presentation, uh, globally and regularly acquired data from Santa Juan and NISAR are, are excellent for hazard monitoring applications. SAR has excellent abilities to map surface water in all weather conditions. Threshold algorithms are able to provide automatic water mapping capabilities. L-Band provides improved ability to map water under vegetation. Um, so it's a better band than C-Band. And finally, there are several public water mapping services that take advantage of their, the capabilities of SAR. And Dr. Meyer would like to acknowledge Copernicus, the European Space Agency, and the NASA, NASA Alaska Satellite Facility DAC uh, for access to the Sentinel-1 SAR data. Uh, thanks to NASA Severe for funding the HydroSAR development efforts, and a special thanks to Thomas Meyer and Lori Schultz and others for their contributions. And here is Dr. Meyer's contact information, his email address, if you would wish to contact him about any questions related to the material that he presented today. And for those wishing to dive in a little deeper, here's some relevant literature that will provide um, more information and further details about uh, using SAR for detecting and monitoring floods. And finally, before we end, uh, here are some links that might be of interest, and they are to selected existing and upcoming SAR-based water mapping services. So with that, we conclude this uh, third and last session of this webinar series. A very big thank you to Dr. Franz Meyer for the presentation and demonstration. Thank you to all participants for the questions that are coming in and, and for your participation and excitement in this topic. We will now start the Q&A session. Great, so we've been assembling your questions in a Google Doc and we will uh, share our screen here shortly and we'll work our way down. Dr. Meyer has started answering your questions. So what I'll do is I'll read the question and he can uh, then provide the answer. We'll work our way from the top down. Uh, before we start, just wanted to remind you that the homework is already posted online and that the recording and the presentation and the, the transcript for this Q&A document will also be posted online. Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Meyer. Let's start with the first question. How can temporal coverage be selectively higher in certain parts of the globe, in Europe, six days and 12 days elsewhere? I was thinking it would be somewhat the same. Yes, uh, do you want me to answer verbally? Yes. Um, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so so as mentioned here, the, the constellation itself in principle with the two satellite constellation could observe a six day uh, sampling everywhere. However, limitations occur in terms of data rates. So how much data can be downlinked uh, through the available downlink stations um, as well as uh, through the duty cycle of each satellite. So each satellite can only be on for a fraction of the total orbit. And so um, it sent one with with these limitations isn't um, uh, capable of observing everywhere globally every six days. So they focus on, you know, places that funded the mission. It's a European funded mission. So they ensure six day sampling over European grounds. Uh, they also have requirements over the Arctic Ocean to help in the monitoring of, of, of sea routes. And so also there where they have six days of better coverage. And um, they provide additional six day coverage over hazard regions, um, many of the geophysically active re regions, such as, you know, volcanic and earthquake sites also receive uh, pretty good six day sampling. California is one of those. Hawaii is another one of those. I hope that answers the question. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two, what is the most appropriate way to choose a threshold value for flood detection from SAR data? Yeah, hopefully that was answered in the presentation. Uh, so in the end, it's best to adaptively choose a threshold for every scene uh, because the uh, what exactly how dark uh, water will look uh, in a scene and how bright the land will look is a little bit different depending on acquisition geometry and environmental conditions. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, uh, you, that was conveyed in the presentation that approaches such as Hydrosar and similar approaches, they end up using an automatic um, way to always identify the, the best threshold for every scene. Wonderful. Question three, is it good practice to use SAR flood maps for validation of flood maps from other hydraulic flood inundation models? Yeah, so these these SAR based flood maps have been used in conjunction with modeling actually in two ways. Um, some uh, models use them uh, for validation that works particularly well in places where you have open surface water. Uh, through the presentation, you've heard that SAR, especially at sea band, has limitations of seeing water under vegetation. Uh, so as long as you have open surface water, you should be able to cross compare SAR and modeling outputs for cross validation. Uh, another way how SAR data have been used uh, for some of these uh, flood forecasting tools also is that they've been used as input data. Um, so these days we are in the sort of era of, of deep learning and machine learning. And so a lot of these um, flood forecasting models have also ingested uh, SAR data um, as sort of input uh, to be better at, at, at forecasting data into the future. Okay, question number four, can radar also detect sedimentation change under the water that is under the, the ocean or rivers? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we SAR, the wavelengths of SAR uh, that are used for SAR, they are not able to penetrate into water surfaces. The uh, dielectric change at the water surface is too high and we are bouncing off of the surface itself. So we cannot see things like um, the, the, the properties of sediments on the on the seafloor. Uh, we also cannot see sort of sediments in the water column itself. Uh, so LIDAR data, some optical data sets are better here. There is some work that's been done to analyze uh, surface structures such as wind roughening. I think there are questions later about that. Also the presence of like oil slicks on the surface, those have been analyzed with SAR. And in coastal zones, some folks have been using SAR to estimate uh, shallow bathymetry. We can do that because there's a linkage between bathymetry and what wave patterns look like on the water surface. So we can measure wave patterns and then infer bathymetry from that. We can't measure bathymetry di directly, but we can sometimes in shallow uh, environments uh, infer bathymetry from uh, you know what it does to uh, wave patterns on the surface. Great. And for those interested, we have an uh, RSET uh, SAR training to detect uh, oil slicks. And that was the last RSET training. I believe that was in, in 2022 for those interested in 
that specific topic. So question number five, what is the expected real-time latency for NISAR and Sentinel, Sentinel-1? Yeah, so Sentinel-1 has a fairly low uh, latency. Usually you get uh, fully processed data uh, within hours, I would say, at, like at max, at max eight hours after an image acquisition. Uh, so it's great uh, for a lot of um, monitoring applications. NISAR will provide data at about the same latency also for areas labeled uh, as sort of uh, urgent response. So these are you know ongoing events uh, that triggered an urgent response mode for NISAR. Uh, also for those, you will get data at about the same latency. For most other data, the data will take a little bit longer, approximately a day, one to two days. This is because uh, NISAR wants to wait for the final orbit solutions to be available so that we have the highest quality data available for analysis. But again, for for data sets labeled as, emergent, uh, as urgent response because they're affected by hazards, you will get uh, data at about a similar latency as Sentinel-1. Okay, question six, where can I learn more about SAR? Are there any short courses or training related to this or a manual? Yeah, so I've provided, there's actually lots of resources. It's been fantastic. The community as as a whole has really come together and provided training resources for new folks to SAR through a variety of, of resources. I listed some of them here. I can expand on those too. And, and, and Erica, please chime in too. You have a really good overview of all the many trainings that RSET has been doing. Uh, so RSET has a number of trainings available for different, for the theory of SAR which is the one I listed here, but also for many applications. We have provided some resources too, those are listed here. Uh, I can uh, work on those a little bit more. The last link I provided here through, to that LearnSAR website actually has a bunch of additional links uh, to resources in it, uh, such as the SAR handbook, such as some, some European resources and so on. Wonderful, yes, there, there are a number of different resources out there uh, for different levels too. So. Yes. I will expand on this. Okay, question seven. Is it advisable to use the L-band data for flood monitoring in a densely vegetated area? And what is the resolution and how do you get the data? Yes, so um, L-band data is gonna be uh, very, very useful for monitoring flood and flooding on the vegetation. Uh, it's gonna be particularly useful for many of the sort of South American countries that are suffering from, from flooding. The data from NISAR is a good resource for that. If you are in South America, you may have access now, I didn't mention that, to data from SAOCOM. Uh, and uh, and so if you put a note in there, I can find uh, a link to SAOCOM resources. Um, um, so NISA will be available at sort of the five-ish meter spatial resolution through ASF. Uh, earlier in the lectures, um, you saw a link to ASF search interface and through that, you will be having access to NISAR data. Great, question number nine, is SAR, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, question eight, which band would be most optimal for mapping rice paddy fields? Yeah, so I'm not a, an expert in rice mapping. I know there is an actual really good SAR RSET training that's linked uh, below that focuses particularly on crop mapping um, um, there have been work on uh, both SAR and a uh, C-band and X-band SAR for mapping uh, rice paddies uh, and, and also the development of rice crops uh, uh, in, in rice paddies. Both of them were successful. Um, so there's a variety of work out there. I'm not sure if we know enough quite yet about what's optimal uh, for, for monitoring rice, but as more C-band, L-band, and expand data become available, I think this is going to become more established. Okay, question nine. Is SAR L-band able to penetrate highly dense and tall trees, such as those found in tropical areas like in Ecuador or Colombia, in order to create reliable INSAR and GRD products, or would P-band be advised in such cases? Yeah, so L-band does have pretty good vegetation penetration capabilities, and it will provide better ability to like track surface displacement using INSAR in places that are vegetated. Um, so I would advise to initially work with L-band data, um, such as the ones that will become available with NISAR and the ones you may already have access to with SAOCOM if you are from the region. Um, 
there is going to be a so you'll enter a space where you will have L band and P band data available at the same time over those regions, Ecuador and Colombia, and it would be worth uh, contrasting those two uh, for their respective uh, capabilities. Um, you may have some very dense forests where L band is not enough and doesn't provide quite the penetration you want, and you may have to pivot to P band. But luckily, starting I would say. 2025, so it's not quite there yet, but you're getting there. Uh, you will have data from both at both frequencies, and the data sets will all be freely available from both L band and P band, so that you can explore, you know, what is the better band for your particular region. And I provided links to the missions here, and L band data again will be available through ASF. Uh, P band data will be available through ESA. Yeah, so the next couple of years will definitely be exciting times in terms of uh, uh, new uh, radar data uh, becoming available in these different frequencies. Question 10, my request for an account in Open Science Lab is pending. Is there any other way I could access the data? And in uh, part two, in session two yesterday, some participants had questions about how long it takes for their ASF account to be approved. Yeah, let's start with data access first, which is the second part of my answer. If you're just looking to discover data and, and download them to your local machine, you can always stop by our search client. Uh, the link is provided here, the search.asf.alaska.edu. If you actually want to do your research uh, next to the archive, then Open SAR Lab is, is your, your way to go. Um, we used to have a automatic open enrollment on Open SAR Lab until recently. Unfortunately, we had a few people enroll in the platform that abused the platform for things it wasn't intended for. So we had to at least temporarily suspend the open enrollment. So right now we're doing manual enrollment, which takes a bit longer, but you should get a response from the team within one or two days after your request. So uh, I apologize for that and uh, ask for your patience. Uh, but if you're requested for access, you should get an email from the team with information. Um, we are working currently how we can accelerate uh, the approval process while uh, ensuring that the platform remains safe. Um, so, sorry about that. We only had a few cases so far, so most of the community has acted responsibly. Uh, but unfortunately, we had a, a few cases that prevented us, prevent us for now from just granting you automatic access when you apply. Uh, so, right now, it's going to take about a day or two until the team gets to your particular request. Um, so I, I ask for your patience for that. Okay, question 11, what is the difference between SHV and SVH? Yeah, so the S in this case just stands for the scattered backscattered power uh, and the HV and VH correspond to the horizontal transmit vertical receive versus vertical transmit horizontal receive cross pole channels. It turns out while we formally do happen do tend to distinguish between those two for the spaceborne radars we have in space right now those are the same so whether you are acquiring in vh or hv the response is is intrinsically the same what we usually do if we have both available we average them to get a, a better signal to noise um, but you can consider them identical if they're coming from the same sensor so if you have vh and hv from sentinel one or from, say, Radarsat or from, from a mission like that, uh, you can treat them as identical uh, for your research purposes. Great. So let's jump to question number 13, since 12 is more relevant to session number two. Um, and in the interest of time here, question 13, I'm experiencing dark pixels in areas surrounding the river in the before flood image and bright pixels in the after flood image. Moreover, some researchers use pre-processing even in level one GRD2. Why is that? Yeah, so we usually do uh, pre-processing um, beyond what the GRD provides. Uh, we usually do a full geocoding and radiometric terrain correction. The geocoding makes sure that every pixel in your image does align with its correct physical coordinates on the ground so that you can overlay optical data with SAR data sets. That's not always true for GOD data, uh, especially in places that are more mountainous. So I suggest to do full geocoding. If you're working in GAE, the GE data are fully geocoded. Uh, what we also do is we often do radiometric terrain correction, which ensures that in every pixel, the radar brightness has physical meaning. 
Um, so that makes, uh, you know, flood mapping, but also other classification efforts more robust. Uh, so I suggest to do both RTC processing and um, and full geocoding uh, for your data sets. ASF has resources for those available. If you have questions, you can uh, send me an email. There's also Opera, uh, you know, missions like Opera, they're providing now fully geocoded data for Sentinel-1 also. Uh, so follow up with me with my contact information if you have more information about that. Regarding the case of brightening after floods, uh, it could be that you have vegetation, either taller grasses uh, or you know maybe taller vegetation around the river that got inundated and, and caused a brightening in these areas um, uh, because of increased double bounds there. Okay, question 14. Could stormy sections of oceans be confused with land cover due to the scattering from the rough surface? Yes, I addressed that at the very end. So wind blowing over water does increase the uh, rate of brightness and makes uh, sometimes uh, water surfaces look like land surfaces in, in sort of their brightness characteristics. Um, we we do something to mitigate this problem by using both the copoles, so the VV or HH band, and the cross-pole bands, so the VH or HV bands together uh, for flood mapping. The cross-pole bands tend to be less sensitive to wind roughening and, and provide a bit more robustness. That being said, if you image during extreme wind conditions, say if you image during landfall of a hurricane or, or, or typhoon, then even the HV band may not be robust enough and you may lose some water detections because of wind roughening. So there are cases during very strong winds uh, where you may have issues. Uh, finding water using using these threshold approaches. Great. Um, I'm going to jump to the more relevant questions related to this uh, this uh, session and also those related to the demo. So let's just go to uh, question 16. While doing sampling and classification, if we're certain about the local area that inundation occurred, but the SAR is not showing it, what do we do? Do we follow local observations or do we rely on what SAR is showing? Yeah, so I would rely, if you're certain about your local observations, I would re, I would rely on those. You may miss uh, water detections in SAR for a number of reasons. One of them is vegetation cover. So if flooding occurs under vegetation. Uh, the other one could also be mixed pixels. Uh, so if you, have, if you have a SAR product that's provided say a 10 or 20 meter resolution and the pixel is only partly covered in water, it may not be detected as an open water pixel because its brightness is a little bit elevated because the brightness is going to be a mix of the water fraction and the land fraction. And then lastly, what I also mentioned is SAR data is only available on, you know, on certain days and you may actually miss the peak of flooding. And so that may also cause a difference between the SAR detections and your local observations is that if they come at different times and the event is dynamic, you may get a difference between those two. And in that case, if you're certain about your local observations, I would rely on those. Okay, uh, question number 18. This is related to the demo. Can we have a GitHub link for the homework notebook from the Hydro 30 via binder? I can't yes, uh, download the notebook. Mm -hmm. Right, the notebook is exposed on GitHub. Uh, so you can download the notebook from there. I provided the link here in this document um, uh, for you to go to and download the, the notebook file. Wonderful. Um, ninth, question 19, you said flooding between trees becomes bright pixels. How about flooding in a residential area? Yeah, so in residential areas, you may uh, see a similar uh, situation if the, um, the, the uh, buildings are close enough so that you get a double bounce from the inundated uh, landscape and the, the, the buildings around it. Uh, that being said, is is flood mapping in urban environments with SAR is still a research topic, uh, and uh, there's a variety of different approaches out there to try to optimize uh, flood mapping in urban settings, and a simple threshold approach like the one that we've shown today may not be necessarily your best choice. If that's something that you're most interested in, you can email me and I can provide you some links to literature. Okay, question 20. Does soil moisture scattering used for flood detection behave similarly in slopes? In other words, could the same principle be used to monitor soil saturation on slopes? Yeah, so 
Sar, one of the applications, NYSAR actually will provide a global soil moisture product that uses this relationship of soil moisture to radar brightness. So in principle, yes, those principles also apply on slopes. Um, um, if you really want, to, if you want to know more about how to estimate soil moisture from SAR data, I can. You can contact me, and I can connect you with an expert. I'm I'm personally not using SAR for soil, soil moisture estimation, but I can uh, connect you with some of the folks from the NYSAR team that are working on the soil moisture product. Okay. Uh, question twenty one. Could on slide 41, I've seen a white and bright line on the SAR images. What is that? Yeah, so I should have mentioned that. In the example I showed on slide 41 is I used um, Sentinel-1 GRD images as a basis um, uh, to provide sort of this time series. Um, GRD images do not overlap between neighboring frames. And in fact, sometimes there are slight, very narrow gaps between two neighboring GRD images, and that's what you see here. So this line is a gap between two data sets. If you want, want to avoid those gaps, I recommend that you use a Sentinel-1 SLCs, single look complex images, as your source for mapping. They actually slightly overlap with each other and ensure that you have contiguous mapping um, everywhere. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour here. Let's just take uh, uh, two more questions and then we'll close off the session. All questions will be answered and posted on this uh, Google Doc online. So let's just go to the next question. I'm not familiar, question 22. I'm not familiar with my binder. Is it like Google Colab? Yeah, my, my binder is a, a free service that you can use to exercise a notebook. In that sense, it's similar to what Col Colab uh, provides. It provides sort of temporal cloud computing uh, as well as some some temporal storage space. Uh, you need to sort of exercise a notebook and get familiar with the workflows in a notebook. Uh, it does not provide persistent storage though. So if you want to do research, uh, you may want to instead use something like Open Science Lab where you have more perpetual storage available. But yeah, so in many ways, it's similar to Colab. One difference is you don't actually need an account for MyBinder. You just can just click the link and have it spin up. Uh, it will shut down after like 10 minutes and free the resource again. Um, so it doesn't provide accounts, um, um, but it doesn't provide temporal, uh, permanent storage. So it's more to exercise a workflow and not to actually do your own research more, um, more um, you know, consistently. Okay, great. And then I'm going to jump uh, as a last question. I think this is a really interesting one. Um, it says, uh, question 38, for optimal results with the algorithm, what would be the minimum length of the time series recommended? Yeah, so we, the, this particular algorithm that we are using here, uh, or I presented here, works on single images. So it doesn't actually require a time series. That choice was made intentionally so that the algorithm can be applied uh, in, in sort of immediate response where you may not have a time series available for, for, your, for your work. There are time series approaches too that use sort of change detection in time series to have more robust uh, detection of, of, of flood extent. Um, but the, the approach that we looked at here is a single image approach. However, of course, if you want to monitor the unfolding of an event, uh, it makes it makes sense to not only use a single image, but but apply the approach to various to a series of images and then analyze uh, the flood extent as a time series. Wonderful. So, unfortunately, due to uh, our time limitations. Uh, we can't get to all of these questions. Again, the, all of them will be answered. They'll, they've been collected in this document and we'll be posting the document in a couple of days. So with that, uh, this ends this webinar series. I would like to remind everyone that the homework is online. Due date is November 17th. And you will receive a re certificate of completion if you complete the homework by the due date and you've attended all live sessions. Uh, before I close, I'd like to thank the RSET team for making this possible. Brock Blevins, Selwyn hudson Odoi, Natasha Johnson-Griffin, Sarah Kutshaw, Jonathan O'Brien, Amita Mehta, Sean McCartney. And 
I would like to thank our amazing guest lecturers, Marlene Johansson from the Arctic University of Norway, Eric Fueling from JPL, and today's amazing uh, guest lecturer, Dr. Franz Meyer from uh, the uh, ASF DAC and University of Alaska Fairbanks. Before I close, uh, Dr. Meyer, would you like to say any, uh, any closing words? I just want to thank you. I'm really excited for all of for the level of interest uh, that exists right now in in the topic of SAR. Um, if you if you have you know questions about resources, if you need, if you have ideas for how we can make these data sets more accessible, please reach out uh, either to Erica, to myself, to Aset, to ASF. We as a community, I think we want to make sure that these data sets that are becoming available are as useful. Uh, to all of you as they can be, and we have still a long way to go. So your feedback and your input is is very important for us, uh, and and hopefully we'll see each other at AGU or some upcoming conferences. If if so, then please say hi. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a luxury having you here, Dr. Meyer, and we hope uh, that you return and you come back, especially once NYSAR, uh is in orbit and and starts uh, generating amazing data. So we hope to have another RSET training sometime in uh, uh, June, July, August of next year. Um, so uh, thank you so much to all of the participants. It's really refreshing to see so much excitement for SAR and a growing uh, community of SAR users. Um, as I mentioned, any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, to reach out to uh, Dr. Meyer. And uh, we hope to um, see you in the next ARSA training or at any of the upcoming conferences. Uh, wishing you all a, a great day and until next time. Goodbye.